So welcome to lecture 10. Today we're going to focus on more of the specific body systems with regard to infections. So we're looking at respiratory, digestive, and cardiovascular systems in that order. And there are tons of different infections that you could look at with any of these. So keep in mind that what we're going through is just a few examples to kind of help start to get you understanding the, the systems and what can happen to them. So the first system we're going to look at is the respiratory system. And this is an important one because think of it, you always have to breathe and it's something that you're not even conscious of. So every time that you're breathing, you may be susceptible to picking up certain microbes around you. So as I was just saying, respiratory is the most accessible portal of entry because again, you have to breathe and it is constant all day, every day, whether you're awake, whether you're asleep, you are always breathing, which means you are always able to take in microbes through this way. Now, the first thing that I mentioned on this bullet point is the idea that the respiratory infections are usually bacterial or viral. Uh, fungal you usually only see in immunocompromised people. And when we talk about respiratory infections, you have to keep in mind that there's the upper respiratory tract and there's the lower respiratory tract. And the type of infection you'll get, the severity, they differ depending on which one of these areas is being affected. So when you think of the upper respiratory system, what do you think of? What's part of your upper respiratory system? You have your nose, you have your mouth, and you have your trachea. Okay, These things in the upper respiratory system, they are constantly exposed to pathogens. Because again, like I was saying, the idea of breathing, and if you think about the mouth, the mouth is part of both respiratory and digestive. So that gets hit double in terms of taking in pathogens. Now, the good part, <laughs> I shouldn't say really good part since you do get infections, but the good part about upper respiratory infections is they're usually not as serious. And we'll go through some examples of, in a minute and why they're not as serious. Then you have the lower respiratory system. And when you think of the lower respiratory tract, that's now deep within your body, your bronchi and your lungs. Okay, and the bronchi are those branched ends of the trachea. So you have one for each lung. Now, your lower respiratory tract is supposed to stay sterile. Okay? If it does get infected, then you have pneumonia. And when you think of what pneumonia is, that's inflammation of the lungs. And you have to be very careful working in hospitals because your patients will be very susceptible to pneumonia. Okay, especially the older and immunocompromised patients. Now, once a respiratory infection is lower, it's going to be much more dangerous for the person who has it. And we'll give some examples of that. But just keep in mind, first of all, the respiratory tract is the most accessible portal of entry. Okay, you are always breathing. And keep in mind the two different tracks, what exactly is making them up, and the idea that upper respiratory infections are not going to be as serious, they're not going to show as severe symptoms. Okay, so we're going to go through some examples of exact infections that you or your patient might get. The first set of infections that we're going to look at, these are some bacterial diseases of the upper respiratory system. So keep in mind, these are all caused by bacteria, and these are the upper respiratory system. Now, interestingly enough, the middle ear is actually considered part of this, because if you think of any time you have ear infections, your sinuses can be infected, and it affects the whole upper region of your body. Now, the ones that I want to point out on this slide, first up, we have pharyngitis. Okay, pharyngitis is a fancy way of saying strep throat. Okay, classic sore throat. And as we saw in lab, 
this infection is caused by strep pyogenes. Now, funny enough, the next one on this list, scarlet fever, is also caused by strep pyogenes. But now what's different from pharyngitis, the reason why symptoms will look more severe, is that exotoxins are now circulating. Then the last one on this list is diphtheria. And with diphtheria, I want you to write down DI for diphtheria and DI for dye. Okay, diphtheria is the only upper respiratory system infection that we're going to talk about that is life threatening. Okay, so out of the upper respiratory system infections, diphtheria, always think die, life threatening. The reason this one's so problematic is that the patient will have exotoxins circulating in their blood, and that's going to end up damaging the heart and the kidneys and you can end up with toxemia. So now you have these toxins circulating all over which can give septic conditions um, and your patient can very, very quickly lose function of their organs. And once a patient's kidneys fail, that usually means that they're not gonna make it, okay? Now the good part about this is that diphtheria is part of the DTaP vaccine. Okay, or sometimes you see it written as TDP vaccine. Okay, so there is the vaccine that helps protect people from diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis. Okay, so remember those three. Diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis can be prevented with that vaccine. Okay, so when you think of upper respiratory system infections that are bacterial, that are caused by strep pyogenes. Think of pharyngitis, scarlet fever, diphtheria, and that they're all varying in symptoms or severity because of the idea of exotoxins. And remember, we learned that exotoxins are the more lethal of toxins that microbes can produce because exotoxins, the bacteria is still alive. So it can keep pumping out that toxin into your patient and hurting them. Now, with the upper respiratory system, you can also get viral infections. And the big, most common one is the common cold. And when you think of the common cold, um, know that they're actually caused by all different viruses. So there's over 200 different viruses. A lot of times you'll see them called rhinoviruses or coronaviruses and any of you who also are interested in vet veterinary information or who have ever had pets uh, coronaviruses are commonly found in dogs so uh, the dog will end up showing diarrhea and gi issues from coronaviruses okay sars um, is also a respiratory coronavirus okay now with the common cold, you'll notice that people will be sneezing, their nose will be stuffed up, they'll have that kind of congestion, but they will not have a fever, okay? So when you see fever, that's more flu-like, whereas common cold, no fever. And with this infection, always remember, antibiotics are of no use because it's a virus, okay? We already learned antibiotics will do nothing for the virus, but what will they do? They'll kill off the normal flora and they'll end up making your patient much more susceptible to superbugs and to all other kinds of infections. So when your patients are you know, coming in complaining of something that's clearly just a cold, don't let them bully you into giving them antibiotics just because they wanna leave you know, with a pill that they think will make them better when it will just make them worse. And what I want to point out, what I like about this slide, is that I threw in the little best foods, the best foods to fight cold and flu over here. And, you know, so many times we think, oh, you know, that's just an old wives' tale, or, you know, you picture little old grandmas telling you these things, and you kind of like tune it out, like, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, that, that'll really work. And, you know, 
you sometimes think, well, if it's not, you know, real medication or antibiotic, it won't do anything. But the funny part is, is that all of the things in this diagram over here, in this little picture, all of these things do actually help in terms of fighting any kind of infection, whether it's the cold or the flu or bacterial or viral, because think about their biological traits of some of the aspects of these foods. So for instance, things like ginger and turmeric, they're vasodilators. And what do you know about vasodilators? They open up your blood flow, they increase blood flow. And why is that good when you have an infection? Think about it, increased blood flow. Well, now my white blood cells and my immune cells are going much, much faster, much more robustly to the sites of infection. So these things help your immune system and things like honey, for instance, they have natural antimicrobial properties. Okay, so for a lot of these things, these will actually help because they're immune boosting and they help your blood flow and they help the white blood cells get where they're going. Okay, so, you know, don't believe when someone tries to tell you, you know, place this stone on, you know, your wrist, then you'll feel better. No, those things don't work. But there's a lot of biology behind certain foods and herbs that actually do work and will help you. And notice that in that picture, one of the things is water. Always make sure that you're properly hydrated, especially when you're sick, and that your patients are properly hydrated as well. Okay? Now, that is the upper respiratory system, but as we mentioned, you know, sometimes things get a little worse and patients may end up with lower respiratory system infections. The ones on this list were fo first focusing on bacterial infections. So whenever you see these terms, keep in mind bacterial, okay, and that they are the lower respiratory system. So be very comfortable with what's an infection of upper, versus what's an infection of lower respiratory system. The first one we have on this list is bronchitis. And as you can tell by that word, this is inflammation of the bronchial tubes or your bronchi. Whereas pneumonia, what's infected and inflamed now, that's your lungs, okay? When you hear pneumonia, that's inflammation of the lungs. The next one on this list is tuberculosis. and any time that I ask about tuberculosis, I'm going to ask you the same questions. Okay, you'll see this come up on one of the slides in a minute, and you've heard me say this before. When you think of tuberculosis, first ask yourself what causes it, which is mycobacterium, okay, mycobacterium, which we said are the ones with mycolic acid in their cell wall. And because of that mycolic acid in their cell wall from the mycobacterium, how can you stain for infections like tuberculosis? The zeolnesin acid fast stain. Okay, so if you can't remember how to spell it, that's okay. Just always know acid fast stain is for mycobacterium, such as tuberculosis. And ask yourself, can you remember the other one? that that stain can show you, which is leprosy, okay? So whenever you hear tuberculosis, think acid fast. And then the last one on this list is pertussis. And the other name you hear that by is whooping cough because of that cough, that you know constant cough, which makes that whooping sound. And why is that cough? That's because in that person, their ciliary escalator is destroyed. So that was part of the immune system that we talked about. So their ciliary escalator, which is supposed to help push mucus out of your respiratory system, now that's destroyed. So the mucus is stuck there. And so you reflexively will start coughing to try and get it out, trying to get that mucus out. Okay, so this can be visualized in the next slide. <clears throat> so this slide shows you the idea of whooping cough. And 
in this little picture down here, okay, right over here, that shows you the pertussis, the Bordetella pertussis bacterium. They're attaching to the cilium, and what they do is they release toxins, and their toxins will destroy these cilia. So now, with that cilia in your respiratory system destroyed, mucus cannot move up and down. So as I was just saying, you end up with that constant cough because the cilia have been destroyed by toxins and you now have no way to properly get the mucus out of the respiratory system. So you cough in it up trying to get it out. Now, one of the problems with this is it also produces a capsule. So these bacteria really attach to all of those cilium and that's part of why it causes such a big problem because they really stick all along that respiratory tract and can release those toxins to to destroy those cilia. Okay. Now the other problem here is when you're dealing with toxins they can enter the bloodstream so you are going to see that this will be a more problematic infection than let's say some of the upper respiratory problems with let's say just having you know a sore throat okay now as i mentioned before with diphtheria the good thing with pertussis is that you can prevent it and ask yourself how do we prevent it the dtap vaccine okay so as I said, sometimes you see the letters arranged slightly differently, TDP, uh, DTAP, same thing. That's one vaccine that helps prevent diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis, okay? Now, one other thing that I wanna mention with pertussis, we said that it's the ciliary escalator that has been destroyed. So just to always keep reminding you of things we talked about in the past, what part of the immune system is the ciliary escalator? That's the innate immune system, okay? So remember any of those barriers for infection, that is innate immune system. So now just a brief little slide on tuberculosis. As I mentioned a minute ago, tuberculosis is caused by mycobacterium. Remember that is different from mycoplasma. So mycoplasma has no cell wall, whereas mycobacterium, they have a cell wall and it's very heavy in mycolic acid, which is why what stain can identify it? The acid fast stain okay zeal nisin acid fast stain now with tuberculosis kind of picture what symptoms you think of a patient having so you think of that you know coughing up blood symptoms so remember the picturing the red stain for these the acid fast shows tuberculosis positive. And interestingly enough, the symptoms of TB, things like coughing up blood, becoming bedridden, becoming very pale from the pool, pooling of the blood, uh, this actually led to people creating the mythology of vampires because people didn't know what tuberculosis was back in the day. They didn't know that there was this bacteria causing all of these symptoms. All they knew is that suddenly, a person would be very weak, have to lay in bed as if the life was draining from them. They would be laying in bed so long that you know pool, the blood would pool away from the outer surface of their skin so they'd appear very pale and drawn. They were coughing up blood all the time. So of course they had the remnants of blood around their mouth and they would very quickly succumb to this infection. And then once they passed away, their relatives would start to get the same drawn look, pale look, blood around their mouth, and they would get the same kind of, you know, appearance and then pass away. So basically, if you think about vampire mythology, that pale skin, even the sensitivity to the light people with tuberculosis get photoreceptor sensitivity. 
So the sensitivity to the light, the idea of that blood and of the highly infectious nature of it, you know, they didn't know bacteria is highly infectious. All they thought was that the deceased was coming back and feeding off the life of their relatives and taking them with them as well. Okay, so it's a little interesting fun fact. Whenever you hear vampires, think of the fact that it was actually tuberculosis. Okay, and I put some other causes on here as well. So it's not always mycobacterium tuberculosis. Sometimes it's bovis or avium. But with these, notice that in all these cases, it's mycobacteria. Okay, so the, the end word might change, but the genus of mycobacteria stays the same. Now, in terms of diagnosing tuberculosis, I'm pretty sure that what's on this page you have all experienced because anyone who goes to volunteer or work in a hospital, you have to get tuberculin skin testing. Okay, so as you can see in this picture on this slide, you look to see if a wheel, so that's W-H-E-A-L, wheel, is produced when someone injects a little bit of the purified protein derivative or antigen of tuberculosis in your skin. Okay, so you will hear this test called PPD test. Again, that stands for the purified protein derivative, which is a fancy way of saying antigen. They are taking an antigen or proteins from the tuberculosis bacteria. They're putting it under your skin and they're looking to see whether or not you have the reactions to it. Does your body have antibodies that will instantly fight this reaction or attack this antigen and puff up the skin? Now, what's the problem with this test? Okay. If any of you have had friends or yourself from a foreign country, you know that they will always get a false positive on this exam, uh, sorry, on this exam, on this test, this, this um, PPD test, because many people from foreign countries, it was required for them to have a vaccination against TB because many foreign countries such as India, TB is so prevalent that they have to use vaccinations for it. And so if you've had that vaccination, which is called the BCG vaccine, so Bacillus calmite guerin, you don't have to know that, uh, that terminology, the BCG vaccine in these foreign countries that were given to people, these people now have the antibodies for TB. So they, they did not have TB and they do not necessarily currently have TB, but because their body has the antibodies that they produce from the vaccine, they will always show a positive result on a PPD test, okay? The other problem with this test, as you can kind of pick up from what I was just saying, is this test will show you if your body has antibodies against TB. What doesn't that tell you? Whether or not it's a current infection. You may have a previous infection or may have had a previous infection, and now you'll come up positive from this test because you have the antibodies. So the skin test does not show you uh, whether or not it's a current infection. For things like that, you need to have an X-ray or CT, full-blown, you know, culturing of your of your sputum for that. Okay, but at least it is a way to kind of initially detect whether or not you've been exposed. They're also developing newer rapid blood tests and um, PCR testing, which, as you know, PCR testing is nucleic acid based testing. Okay. Now, on this slide, I have a whole bunch of different forms of pneumonia listed. Okay. Pneumonia, now we're getting really deep into those lungs. Um, as I point out on the slide, you don't have to memorize all of these. It's just to show you that there are various different types of pneumonia. There's typical and atypical, which will have some slides dedicated to that information in a minute. 
There's also a breakdown of lobar, bronco, and pleurisy, which is basically kind of specifying what part of the lungs are infected. So for some patients, it may just be the lobes of the lung. For others, just the alveoli. And for yet again others, it'll be the pleural membranes. So those last three are not about what's causing the pneumonia, like which, which bacteria, but rather they're focusing on the localization of the infection, okay? Now, to zoom in or kind of focus in on the top two typical and atypical pneumonia. First, we have the typical pneumonia, which is pneumococcal pneumonia. Okay, this was one that you see a lot of times in terms of advertisements for the vaccines and everything. With pneumococcal pneumonia, it's caused by strep pneumonia. Okay, so interestingly enough, you hear strep again, like we did in our labs. Okay, with these, since you already know strep is gram positive, right? Um, with this one, it's a diplococcus stru uh, structural arrangement, meaning so it's in pairs. And with this, ask yourself, so if I gram stained the sputum of a pneumonia patient, what would it look like? Well, gram positive, it would be a purple gram stain. And because it's strep based, strep pneumonia, it would be round shaped. Okay, so always remind yourself what would a gram stain of this culture look like because there are a lot of cultures that you take in hospitals to gram stain. Okay, now with this, the patient then ends up with a lot of fluids filling up the lungs um, and red blood cells, and this kind of uptake in the lungs then interferes with oxygen, um, ox proper oxygen maintenance. Okay. Now, like I just mentioned a minute ago, you hear a lot of advertisements for vaccines. So the good part about typical pneumonia is that there is vaccination against it. And it's specifically a conjugated vaccine. So if you look back at our other slides, conjugated simply means that they tie a weak antigen to a strong antigen so that it really produces a much better immune response for you when you get that vaccine versus whether, you know, had they just put one of those antigens into your system at once, because you really want a good immune response when you get the vaccination so that you know that you have proper antibody production. <clears throat> Now, this adorable slide of uh, what looks like little fried eggs in the corner, uh, this is now atypical pneumonia, okay? Atypical pneumonia is caused by mycoplasma, so mycoplasmal pneumonia, and that should sound very familiar to you, okay? So this causes walking pneumonia, it's mycoplasma, we mentioned this guy before, now, what did we say was significant about mycoplasma? Well, this is the one that has no cell wall. And when you think about the bacterial structure, the idea that it has no cell wall is significant because it means now to target this infection, which is going to be an infection of respiratory issues, low fever, cough, headache, things like that, to target this infection, you cannot use things like penicillins that will target the cell wall because this bacteria doesn't have a cell wall, okay? So what they have to do instead is rely on things like tetracycline. So tetracycline, they target ribosomes. So when you think of ribosomes being targeted, well, what are they blocking now? Protein synthesis in that bacterium. And as you know, proteins, they do just about everything in cells. So when you mess with proteins, it's a good way to target and destroy something. Okay. Now, interestingly enough, the idea of no cell wall doesn't just affect how you treat it, but it also affects what it looks like. So this little corner picture here, that fried egg appearance is basically that if a cell has no cell wall for a bacterium, 
then they could take any shape they want. Okay, so <laughs> they could be anything they wanted. They chose to be an egg. Um, <laughs> they basically tend to concentrate together in the center, and then you see a thinning out of colonies around the edges. So whenever you hear mycoplasmal pneumonia, I want you to think of a few things. I want you to think of atypical walking pneumonia. I want you to think of no cell wall. So penicillin or similar antibiotics won't work. Instead, you need tetracyclines. And I want you to remember fried egg appearance. So whenever you see fried egg appearance, boom, that tells you you're dealing with mycoplasma, which has no cell wall, okay? Now, the last one that I wanna mention for the respiratory system is influenza, which is the flu. Now, keep in mind, if you notice what we talked about in these slides so far, you'll notice that the flu is lower respiratory, whereas the common cold is upper respiratory, okay? So when you compare these two things, if you think about someone who has a cold versus someone who has the flu, well, if you have a cold, Sure, you're not feeling that great, but odds are you're still feeling, you know, well enough that you could drag yourself out of bed, you could get to work, you could go to school still. Whereas when someone has the flu, what do you notice? The symptoms are much worse. Now they have things like fever, chills, bad headaches, muscle pains. And when you have the flu, you end up calling out sick from work, from school. Okay, so that will kind of help remind you which is which in terms of location, because we said that upper respiratory systems are not as severe, whereas lower respiratory systems, these are now more severe. Okay, now when you think of the flu, the other thing to remember is that it's a RNA genome virus. And as you know, anything with RNA genomes in terms of microbes, they're gonna be much more problematic, okay? With RNA, you have gene reassortment, you have prone to mutations, you end up having issues where the high mutation rates of these viruses make it very difficult to treat them. And also even with vaccines, you'll notice flu vaccines, you have to get different ones every year because by the time the next year comes around, the most common strain has now mutated enough that you know the antigens, the antibodies, they're not recognizable at this point, okay? The other problem with the flu that I want you to remember is that the most common complication is going to be bacterial superinfections, okay? And if you ask yourself why, this is something that we've discussed a lot already. You think about patients. When patients come in to see you and they're really, really sickly feeling, what do they want? They wanna be given a pill or they wanna be given a medication so that now they're not gonna to wanna to leave unless they have that medication. But as you know, what's causing the flu? It's a virus. So if these people are constantly be give, being given antibiotics for the flu, for a virus, for something that you know they may not have been cultured at that medical facility, well now, what did those antibiotics do? It killed the normal flora. And so now the pathogens that are resistant, they rise up they take over, they're now replicating, they're very robust, and now this patient has bacterial infections in addition to the flu that they've trying to fight. Because think about it, once you have the flu, you're now also immunocompromised. So messing around with things like antibiotics, that just makes it much, much worse situation. So that was the respiratory system. And now in that same idea of, you know, first thinking of the mouth and then onward, uh, we also have the digestive system as a major portal of entry. Because if you think about it, you always got to eat, you always have to drink. And we already talked about in lab and lecture quite a few times, the idea of how problematic water contamination is.
all across the world. So now the digestive issues that we talk about now, these will be the foodborne illnesses and contaminated water problems, as well as dental issues as, uh, as well. So as I was just saying, digestive is the other major portal of entry. It has a lot of defenses, so especially things like enzymes that we've talked about in terms of the innate immune system. But infections of this area are still very common. And the first part of the digestive system is the mouth, which sometimes people take um, the idea of dental issues. They kind of separate that from the medical field, sometimes not realizing that dental and teeth issues they're very related to microbiology and the, the health of your rest of your body because the microbes on your teeth can end up getting other places and cause some major problems, including they're finding more and more of um, the dental microbes, your, your plaque microbes traveling to other places, including the brain and the heart. So if you ever take medical micro, we go more into detail with those issues. So now focusing on the mouth as a major portal of entry for digestive microbes, think of dental and periodontal infections and think of what plaque is. So we've already mentioned plaque before being biofilms. And what did we say biofilms are? That's a collection of a whole bunch of different bacteria sticking together and making it more difficult to treat now these biofilms are attached to the outer film of your teeth. The big main one is strep mutans, which is cariogenic. So cariogenic means that it will convert sucrose to lactic acid and produce dextran. That's a fancy way of saying you're getting acids produced on the outer coating or outer film of your tooth that's going to corrode or eat away that protective enamel and produce things like um, cavities. Now, in addition to this plaque issue, you get specific infections of the dental area. Two that you've probably heard a bunch of times, especially in commercials for mouthwash, are gingivitis and periodontitis. So you have to ask yourself, what's the difference between these two infections? And I want you to circle, star, highlight, these differences. So gingivitis, if you hear that, that's inflammation limited to the surface of your gums. Okay, so gingivitis is inflammation and infection of the surface of your gums. Then you have periodontitis. That's a deeper infection. So now the infection of the gums has resulted in loss of supportive bones and ligaments. And so this is the one that's responsible for most tooth loss of adults. Okay, so you have gingivitis is just inflammation and affection of the surface of the gums, whereas periodontitis is infection of the gums that goes deeper into the supportive bones and the ligaments and results in tooth loss. Okay, so always make sure you're being very careful in terms of proper dental care, brushing your teeth, going to the dentist, but also be careful of the fact that if you do things too rough with your teeth and your gums, so for instance, if you're someone who makes your gums bleed a lot, that's now creating openings for these bacteria that's coating your teeth area to then travel, okay? And so be very careful with dental work or anything like that because you can get them traveling to the brain and to the heart causing major problems as well. <clears throat> then you have the rest of your digestive system beyond the mouth and beyond the teeth. And you can either have exogenous infections or you can have endogenous infections, okay? So exo means outside. So with exogenous infections, the microbes are coming from the outside, which means where are you getting them from? If it's the digestive system coming from the outside, it means food and water. 
So contaminated food and water cause exogenous infections, whereas endogenous, endo, means inside, within. So what microbes are within, those are your normal flora. Okay, so things like E. coli, right? So exogenous is from food and water, whereas endogenous are infections caused from normal flora. Okay, now most of the bacteria that cause the gastro-related infections, they're causing problems because of enterotoxins. And we've mentioned the enterotoxins before. This is simply one of the subcategories of exotoxins. Okay, so exotoxins, they're being secreted by living bacteria, pumping out these toxins. And in the case of enterotoxins, they're targeting the intestines. And the big example is Shiga toxin, which originally was only thought to be produced by Shigella, but then they discovered that E. coli is also producing it. And what Shiga toxin does is it modifies our RNA to block that binding of mRNA, which is a fancy way of saying shiga toxin blocks protein synthesis. Okay, so I want you to circle, circle the word shiga toxin over here, circle shiga toxin and write blocks protein synthesis. Blocks protein synthesis. Okay. Now, some of the common digestive uh, infections that you'll find or the bacteria causing these infections are E. coli, Shigella, Salmonella, Vibrio, and H. pylori. Okay, you may have heard of quite a few of these. So E. coli, you hear a lot of those contaminations of things like lettuce and romaine recently. Shigella is what causes dysentery. Salmonella, you end up with gastroenteritis or typhoid fever. Vibrio, I want you to circle Vibrio and put seafood poisoning. Okay, so this is a shellfish poisoning. And then H. pylori, I want you to circle H. pylori and write ulcers. H. pylori is the cause of ulcers. Okay, now to go into um, another example with food poisoning. Here we have staphylococcal food poisoning. So Staph aureus, you're all experts at Staph aureus based on the lab session. What are some things that you know about Staph aureus from lab? Well, first of all, what's the big obvious test for Staph aureus? Coagulase testing, okay, coagulase testing. They can produce coagulase and with Staph aureus, with relation to food poisoning, there's something called temperature abuse. Okay, that's what this figure on the side kind of tries to show is temperature abuse. The idea that you'll cook food and so you'll think, oh, okay, I cooked my food, you know, hot flames, fire, it's all, it, it must be safe now. I killed any bacteria in it. But what you then don't think about after that food has been cooked, okay, what do you do with it? You put it in another container, right? You put it on plates. Sometimes, especially with picnics, you'll put it into different bowls or, or kind of prepare it in an additional way. So you'll do further cutting of a cooked meat, for instance. Okay, you're handling that food. And if it's not you, then restaurant workers are doing this, okay? Food preparers. They'll cook the food and think that they've gotten all the bacteria, which they may have, but then when they're preparing it to actually eat or to serve, they're handling it. And where do you know you find staff all the time? On your hands, right? On your skin. So these people who may have staff on their hands, they're now handling the food, and then they may leave it out at room temperature. So again, like I just said, this happens a lot in terms of picnics or in terms of restaurants, you know, where you have any kind of catering, right? So if the food is then left at room temperature, well, whatever contaminants, whatever staff just got into that food from your hands and from preparing it onto the serving platters, 
Well, now those have time to replicate and now those produce their toxins and the toxins get into the food, okay? Now, once you've done that, now that there's toxins in the food, even reheating it, let's say you did all of this and you decide, oh, okay, I don't trust that it. it's been sitting out for you know a few hours. Let me microwave my plate of food. That won't destroy the toxin. That may kill the bacteria that's in there, but that's not going to destroy the toxin. So within one to six hours, um, what we call staphylococcal intoxication will occur, meaning you'll start getting those symptoms in terms of diarrhea, vomiting, uh, cramping, all of that, okay? Now, I mentioned a little question over here. What are some reasons that staph would outgrow other bacteria in this food that you have sitting there well, think about what we learned about staph. Staph are halophiles, right? So you may have this salty, nice, you know, picnic salad or salty meat and think, oh, you know, bacteria don't like salty. Well, staph does. So staph really enjoys a lot of the food that we end up preparing, okay? And the last thing that I show over here is that Age typing tracing can kind of help identify what the source of contamination was, um, but you don't have to worry about that for our processes. It's basically just a form of experimentation that they do when they're trying to track down the exact source of particular uh, food poisoning cases. Now, those are all bacterial infections of the digestive system. The next area to think about are viral infections of the digestive system. Some of the big ones that you've probably heard before are mumps, hepatitis, and gastroenteritis. Okay, so the first one, mumps. When you hear mumps, what is that targeting? Well, that's targeting the parotid glands, okay, parotid glands. So basically the salivary uh, glands, and that's why you see that swelling that is characteristic of mumps. But why is it not so common now? MMR, the MMR vaccine. So vaccinations have helped to dramatically decrease the number of cases of mumps um, that, that you see. And remember MMR, measles, mumps, and rubella. Rubella, which is German measles, okay? all targeting lymph system and salivary glands. Then you have hepatitis A, B, C, D, and E, okay? Viruses cause most of hepatitis cases, and with hepatitis, you have inflammation or infection of the liver. But you always have to ask yourself, what else can cause hepatitis? Well, drug use, alcohol abuse, um, autoimmune diseases even. Some of these, for instance, hepatitis A, you even see on the news right now for foodborne illness. So a food preparer at a restaurant or just um, recently in 2019, um, a ShopRite worker or deli, deli counter worker, they have this infection, they don't realize that they're infectious because they're not showing symptoms yet, and they're handling food. So the food gets contaminated, it gets time to incubate, and then by the time you eat it, you now get infected, okay? Um, the last one on here is viral gastroenteritis, which we'll talk about in a few slides. But when you look at any of these, just remember right off the bat, viral infections, okay? So these are all viruses causing mumps, hepatitis, and gastroenteritis, viral gastroenteritis, and ask yourself what's getting targeted. So mumps, it's parotid glands, okay, salivary lymph glands, and hepatitis, it's the liver, and then gastroenteritis, you're going to see that's um, focusing on the, especially abdominal pain. This slide here is just to show you the various different forms of
hepatitis, you don't have to memorize any of the symptoms or vaccination processes or anything in here. This is just if you wanted a little more information about what your patient might be encountering with each of the different types of hepatitis. What I do want to point out with hepatitis is that there are two terms you should always be aware of and know the meaning of for hepatitis. The first one is jaundice. So if your patient is experiencing uh, jaundice, that's that common yellowing of their skin. It's due to excess bilirubin of heme. Okay, so jaundice is yellowing of the skin. And then cirrhosis is the scarring they get on the liver. So some cases of hepatitis become so bad that there is severe scarring done, which is cirrhosis, C-I-R-R-H-O-S-I-S. -I -R -R -I okay, so that's hepatitis, focusing on the liver. Then the last of the viral digestive infections that I want to mention is viral gastroenteritis. So whenever you hear rotavirus or neuro virus, rotavirus and neurovirus, think viral gastroenteritis. And both of these are rather painful uh, cases of food poisoning. So if you've ever known anyone who had gastroenteritis, it could be quite painful. They might have fever, they might have diarrhea, vomiting, severe kind of cramping. It really knocks them out. And a lot of times they'll be kind of have to stay laying down in bed or on the couch for quite a while. Okay. With these, um, your immune system can kind of take over and naturally fix the problem. Or in some cases with things like rotavirus, you can prevent the issue with a vaccine. Uh, that's usually more that they give for children because rotavirus and gastroenteritis is rather common in children. But with either of these, even though they can be quite painful and problematic in terms of work and school being interrupted, uh, they usually have very low mortality rates. And like I said, a lot of times your immune system can kind of make up for it. There are two things I want to point out on this slide. First off is fecal oral transmission. So fecal oral transmission over here. That's something that we've mentioned quite a few times. So always be aware of things like never touching your food with your hands um, after you've touched anything else. Sometimes just grabbing a door knob handle or even grabbing some of the utensils or table surfaces, you can kind of end up with pathogens on your fingers and then you're touching your food. So always be careful of that. Um, also want to point out that there is mention of low infectious dose. So IG50, what does low infectious dose mean? That's the ID50 that we talked about. So it takes very few of these viruses for you to start showing symptoms, which means that each one is highly virulent. Okay, they're very strong. And um, one other thing I wanna mention with viral gastroenteritis, one of the places you see this a lot cruise ships, okay? So always be careful about certain uh, vacation trips. Cruise ships and resorts tend to get gastroenteritis quite a bit, and especially if you think about cruise ship con conditions. So being out on the water that long, you know, not gonna be necessarily the freshest of food or the best um, process of, you know, refrigeration and everything out there on the water. So always be careful in terms of what you are eating. Now, unlike the respiratory system, you're also going to see a lot of fungal and um, helminth type of infections when we talk about the digestive system. Some of this we've mentioned before, so it's kind of just a review of the, uh, the lecture on fungi and parasites. With the fungal diseases of the digestive system, when you hear mycotoxins, mycotoxins means toxins produced from fungi. And the two examples I always like you to remember are ergot fungal contamination and aflatoxin. Okay, so ergot is the one that we mentioned is a derivative of LSD. 
that's responsible for the Salem witch trials because it causes the hallucinations, it causes um, convulsions and tremors and skin crawling neurological uh, symptoms. And then aflatoxin poisoning is the one that we said aflatoxin B1 is the most potent natural carcinogen. Okay, so aflatoxin B1 was the one that we said is the most potent natural carcinogen. Okay, so keep that one in mind as well. And then in terms of the helminths, so whenever you hear helminth, remember that means worm. Okay, there are a few different types. There are tapeworms, which here you have a listing of all different type of tapeworms, but basically no matter which one you're dealing with, the way that the tapeworms spread are those proglottid structures that we mentioned. So proglottids were the little segments that have male and female reproductive systems that can then separate from the organism. So for instance, it can fertilize itself because it's male and female. And then this little sack of fertilized eggs separates and you then can accidentally ingest it or get it into your body. And now you have the larvae developing and the full sized worm developing as well, feeding off of your system. The next one over here, an example is pinworms. And pinworms, I, I laugh every time I talk about pinworms because I basically have to say itchy butt a whole bunch of times. So pinworms, the big symptom of pinworms is pruritus, which is a fancy way of saying itchy butt, because as you can see in this little diagram, you have the pinworm eggs and larvae right at the very tail end of the colon and the anus region. And a lot of times they will suction on, because you know helminths, a lot of times they have little suctions in their mouth. They'll suction on right at the um, anus lining. And so they cause severe itching. And it's very common, especially in children, for this to happen. And then we have the repeat slides, just to remind you of these quite problematic um, helminths of the digestive system. So the first one we have are the roundworms, which we talked about the big problem being human feces fertilizer, so night soil, or any kind of soil contamination with feces. And this roundworms are the most common parasitic worms. And as you can see from those lovely pictures on this slide, they vary in terms of what can actually happen to your patient if they end up with this infection. They can show no symptoms. They can have migration of the worms to the eyes, to the nose, to the lungs. And the worms can be very problematic if they start perforating intestinal lining or if they're in a very large load, such as the ones in the pictures on this slide where you get a bolus, so this big ball obstruction of worms that have to basically be surgically removed. The other helminth that we've already talked about that is another one of the three big soil transmitted uh, worm infections are hookworms. And this was the one that we said be careful of vacations, be careful of your own backyard. Okay, so this is the one that most common way to get it is through bare feet or sandals, walking on sand, on beaches, on the dirt in your own backyard, or children playing in sandboxes, okay? Because the fecal contamination from things such as stray dogs, stray cats, uh, all kind of organisms roaming around. And they make those little trails in your feet that then get infected and you have allergic reactions to. And then the last reminder slide here, this is the whipworm infections where you know you most likely, again, are getting from contaminated produce, uh, unwashed 
foods such as fruits and vegetables that somehow got contaminated by fecal fertilizer or sewage issues or even the idea of fecal oral transmission. Okay, but you end up ingesting larvae in these um, unwashed foods, uncooked foods, and they take a hold of your GI tract. Now, that puts us through respiratory and through digestive. The last one of the symptoms that we wanna talk about in this lecture is the cardiovascular system. So now we're talking in terms of your blood and your heart. So here on this slide, you see there are a whole bunch of different issues that you could get in terms of blood pathogens. Okay, it's kind of self-explanatory or fairly easy to figure out what's going on in each of these cases. So bacteremia, when you hear bacteremia, there is bacteria in the blood. When you hear viremia, there are viruses in the blood. Fungemia, fungi in the blood. And parasitemia, parasites in the blood. Now, with all four of these examples, bacteremia, viremia, fungemia, parasitemia, any of these simply mean that these microbes are just present in the blood. The last two, septicemia and toxemia, now you have multiple of these pathogens, multiple of the toxins in the blood, and there's reproduction and the production of clinical symptoms, okay? So septicemia and toxemia are the severe clinical symptoms. Septicemia being when um, pathogens in the blood, microbes in the blood and lymph are causing severe symptoms. And toxemia when it is toxins in the blood or lymph that are causing the severe symptoms that you're experiencing or that your patient's experiencing. Then you have your intravascular infections, okay? And I always ask for one of these on the exams or on the final. The first one is endocarditis. If your patient has endocarditis, what's infected? The heart, the heart itself. Thrombophlebitis, which is my favorite one because it looks so different from any of the other words. Thrombophlebitis is infection of the veins, okay? So veins, thrombophlebitis, endoarteritis, that one, just like the word suggests, is the arteries are infected, and then pericarditis, that's the sac around the heart has become infected with the pathogens, okay? So endocarditis is the heart infection, thrombophlebitis is the vein infection, endoarteritis is the arteries, and pericarditis is the pericardial, the sac around the heart. And so we're going to go through a few examples of circulatory system bacterial infections, some of which you may have heard before or even seen. The first one is one of my favorites. So this is the plague. Okay, when it comes to the plague, I want you to remember Yersinia pestis causes the plague. So anytime you see the word Yersinia pestis, that's responsible for the plague. And I want you to associate the plague with the plague doctor, which is seen over here. So I'm kind of jealous that doctors no longer get to wear these outfits because they're pretty cool looking. So the reason the plague doctor looks like that is if you think about the bubonic plague and the horrible conditions at the time where this infection was so problematic, there were tons of people getting sick. There was the just smell of, of disease, of infection, of dead bodies, of just all kinds of problems here. And so what these doctors would do, that beak mask that he's wearing, that's filled with herbs and, and um, other things with smell to ward off smells and because they thought that it was a filter for pathogens. So it's kind of like, you know, the masks that doctors wear today, they were trying to protect their own nose and mouth from getting infected. 
But like I said, it also was filled with herbs for the smell of all of the disease and, and infection that was um, caused by this, this problem. Now, with plague, you'll notice that there are three examples there. There's bubonic plague, there's septicemic plague, there's pneumonic plague. So it basically depends, is the bacterial growth in blood and lymph? Is there septic shock? So is your patient going into um, organ failure? A pneumonic one is focused in the lungs and it is highly contagious as are the other ones as well. But pneumonic plague is very, very airborne contagious with nearly 100% mortality, okay? Um, but now when you see that it's caused by bacteria, the good thing is antibiotics were then able to be used for this kind of infection. Another cardiovascular issue is tularemia. With tularemia, you'll notice that it's a zoonotic disease. So whenever you hear zoonotic, this is coming from animals. As you can see on this slide, especially from this little picture here, okay, this is one of the ones that is carried on things like rabbits, but it's mainly being transmitted because of things like ticks. So please always be very careful about ticks when you're out in any kind of wooded area or, or any even grassy, very grassy areas. And as you can see in the pictures, there'll be these big bulbos forming. So bulbo is that very big um, protrusion on the throat that you're seeing on the skin, and you'll get ulcerations as well. Um, but this is going to be not not seen as much um, in the in the hospitals where you you have now but the good thing about tularemia is very low mortality rate brucellosis this is sometimes called undulant fever so with brucellosis you're seeing a few different forms or, or different species of brucella that can cause that, Brucella being a gram-negative bacillus. And a lot of times this one is caused by milk from infected animals. And the patient will end up having a lot of um, feverish night sweats, aches, malaise being that very, you know, icky kind of um, fatigued feeling. But again, this one's usually not fatal. Then we have Lyme disease, and I want you to be extra aware of this one because of the fact that this is transmitted by deer ticks and that um, you have seen throughout the past couple of years a major, major increase in the number of deer around this region. So around the Jersey region, around the New York region, you see them on campus all the time. And it's funny because so often people just think of, you know, dangers when they see the organism right in front of them. So for instance, if you see the deer right there at that moment, you're like, oh, I probably should avoid that spot. But you don't realize that those deer are walking all over campus, all over the grass, all over the walkways when you're not there. So there are plenty of times, you know, at night you leave for the for the night and now they're roaming all over the grass. And what happens when they're walking along these tall blades of grass and plants? The deer ticks, the ticks on them get brushed off onto the grass. And then what happens when you walk through that grass or you sit on the grass or you, you know, are putting your bags or anything near that grass or that that sidewalk? Well, now you get that little tick on your property, on your skin, OK, crawling on you. And that's how you can get bitten. So please be very, very careful with this. Lyme disease is the most common tick-borne disease that you encounter. It's caused by the bacteria called Borrelia burgdorferi, okay? And you'll notice in this picture right here in the corner, 
that Borrelia burgdorferi, when you look at their shape, they're spiral shaped. Okay, so spiral shaped, one of the one of the few spiral shaped ones that we've encountered so far. Now, when we talk about Lyme disease, I want you to circle star highlight that bullseye rash. Okay, that's the big first phase. You see the bullseye rash where you've been bitten and you might get flu-like symptoms. The reason why I want you to circle this, first off, is I want you to always associate bullseye rash with Lyme disease. But also, I want you to associate this and circle this because of the fact that you notice it's first phase. If you catch Lyme disease, and I, I don't mean if you catch it as in the infectious way, but I mean if you spot and detect Lyme disease in the first phase, you can easily treat it before you get problems, okay? Antibiotics will take care of it without as much issue to you. If it gets to the second phase and then the third phase, you are going to start having major problems. First of all, because it ends up going neurological at later phases. So the third phase, you'll start to have neurological issues, even mental dysfunctions, and it will then start to present autoimmune symptoms. Okay, so a lot of people will mistakenly think that Lyme disease is autoimmune just because of the fact that they're seeing problems in the immune response. Basically, what happens is it inhibits your lymphocyte and cytokine production. So you're not going to have proper immune function. Now, like I said, make sure to remember the bullseye rash because the later the stage, the more difficult it is to treat with antibiotics and the more problems it's going to cause in your life because anything that starts hitting neurological or immune system issues becomes very, very taxing on your everyday life. The last one that I want to mention here is relapsing fever. This is another one of the Borrelia species. This is a spirochete. Okay, so spirochetes, you usually think of syphilis, but relapsing fever is also caused by a spirochete. And again, you're seeing transmission by ticks. So please always be careful. You know, in some of these slides, you notice ticks from rabbits. You notice ticks from deer. In this case, ticks from rodents. Okay, so always be very careful thinking about when you walk on the grass, if you ever try and sit on the grass or when you're outdoors, remember that you're not the only thing that was there, that there are a lot of animals that roam around, whether you're seeing them at that moment or not. And a lot of them can accidentally, you know, drop these little arthropods into the grass or into the walkways or even on seats where you're trying to sit. Okay, so please always be careful when you're outdoors and if you're ever going into the woods or a very heavily brush area, make sure to check yourself. Check your clothing, check under your hair, have someone else check your back, your legs, check all over to try and make sure that you don't see any kind of bites on you and, and keep an eye on things because um, even though there are treatments with antibiotics, you don't want to deal with some of these problems. And things like Lyme disease can cause you problems for quite a long time and relapsing fever as well. Okay, You get relapses, and even though they may not be as severe, it means you know this is something you're stuck with, where it's going to keep coming back, keep causing issues for you. So please always be careful. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of this, keep in mind, I only gave you a little bit of a sampling of the diseases that you can encounter from these symptoms, but working in the medical field, especially in the nursing field, you're going to encounter a whole lot more, but you know, it's too many to list in one class. But I want you to start thinking in terms of picturing respiratory infections, digestive, cardiovascular, whenever you're breathing in, whenever you're speaking, whenever you're eating, you're drinking, be aware of all of the different things that can happen when it comes to microbes. And the last thing to mention is now that we're in the later chapters, uh, do keep in mind the final is usually more multiple choice. So 
uh, in addition to focusing on short answers, now think more in terms of what kind of multiple choice questions can be made from these different slides, okay? Be able to identify things such as if I give the name of Yersinia pestis and that beak-like doctor, well, what, what do you associate that with? Bullseye rashes, what do you associate that with? Okay, so keep these things in mind. And as always, if you have any questions, any concerns, if you're unsure of any slides or topics, just send me a remind message or an email and feel free to screenshot whichever slide is giving you a problem. Okay, thank you.